about the how to pre-process an image using Python. And uh, Ma'am has taught using OpenCV. Uh, now we have the third session. This third session is dedicated to the introduction to pattern recognition and uh, uh, demonstration also. And uh, today we have speaker with us, Dr. Deepak Ranjan Nayak. So, Dr. Deepak Ranjan Nayak is an assistant professor at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, MNIT Jaipur. Prior to this position, he was an assistant professor at the Department of Computer Engineering, SV National Institute of Technology, Surat, India. He worked as postdoctoral fellow at Triple IT. Uh, design and Manufacturing, Kanchipuram, Chennai. He received his PhD degree in Computer Science and Engineering from National Institute of Technology, Raur Kila, India. He has published over 40 articles in peer-reviewed journals and conferences in, in, of international repute. His current research interests include medical image analysis and classification, machine learning, deep learning, pattern recognition, and computer vision. His publication have more than 600 citations, H index of 13 and I10 index of 15. One of his paper was included in ESI highly cited papers. He has received international travel support from department uh, DST, Government of India in 2017. He has also received the outstanding reviewer award by Computer and Electrical Engineering Journal, Elsevier, for the year 2017. He had served also reviewer of many 40 reviewer, uh, peer reviewed journals such as IEEE Transactions on Circuits and System for Video Technology, IEEE Journal for Bioventical and Heart in Informatics, IEEE ACM Transactions, IET Image Processing, IT Computer Vision, Pattern Recognition Letters, Computer Methods and Programs in Biomedicine, Biomedical Signal Processing and Control. He has also served as technical program co-chair and committee member of several conferences of international repute. He is a member of IEEE. So with proud, with proud privilege, I would like to invite Dr. Deepak Ranjan Nayak for the session, Introduction to Pattern Recognition. I welcome you, sir. Sir, please. Yeah, thank you so much, ma'am, for the kind introduction. Uh, so shall I start, ma'am, or shall, uh, yeah, I think 58%. Yes, sir, we can start. Yes, sir, we can start. Yeah, so I must thank all the organizers who are organizing this type of continuous HTTP. I was also part of the previous HTTP there, and um, um, the organizers have assigned me to give an introductory lecture to pattern recognition. Uh, maybe those who have attended already, they, I mean, there will be some you know, similar type of things. Uh, I hope uh, I have added a few even uh, new things into it, and the uh, most important thing is. Uh, uh, definitely, I will try to show you uh, one. I mean, I will show you one article related to medical uh, emails. I mean, it is of course related to pattern recognition, and how will we implement that paper uh, using the? Uh, I will also discuss one algorithm related to pattern recognition. I mean, one recognition algorithm, and uh, we will try to use that algorithm particularly to solve the problem. Right. So let me uh, share my screen and uh, thank you all for joining with us. Very good afternoon. Yeah, perhaps a puja, please check whether my screen is visible or not. Even am I audible or not? Yes, sir, you are audible and screen is also visible. Actually, some of the I think one participant has uh, commented that my voice is not clear. I hope uh, he is having some problem, right? Gopal Krishna, please stop presenting. Oh, again, I have to present, right? Yes, sir. Is my screen is visible right now? Or somebody else has presented? No, no, sir. It is now visible. Every participant need to pin the screen of presentation of Deepak, sir. Yeah, yeah. Please, please. So uh, let us start our discussion today. Uh, as I mentioned, that what I'll be discussing in the next one and a half hour is the simple what do you mean by pattern recognition? We'll talk about what is a pattern and why we need pattern recognition and what are the current challenges as well as what are the applications where 
pattern recognition has already been applied successfully we will also see and that we are also using in our day to day life and uh, i'll be talking about some of the you know fundamentals of pattern recognition that almost many of you also knows but still i will cover all these things and at last i will discuss one very fundamental uh, algorithm classification technique and using that technique as i mentioned that i will pick up a problem related to medical image uh, classification problem and and we'll see that uh, how we can solve the problem and uh, for that i have also selected one paper related to that luckily i got that and uh, we will definitely be as uh, seeing that how to implement that paper and after after uh, discussing with the techniques whatever i'm going to discuss today so let us start our discussion today uh, with uh, the definition of the pattern uh, and recognition right there are two terms pattern and recognition so any object any object that we see in the world that forms a pattern for example if i'll take uh, if i'll take an uh, you know, a picture of a cat that also forms a pattern and if i uh, take an image of a truck or a car that also forms a pattern whatever we are hearing that also can form a pattern so pattern is something very the simple uh, way i am explaining it that a pattern is something which describes what we see in the real world what we hear what we sense right and the definition which over there is the book is definition if you can see they are calling it the pattern is an uh, abstract object such as a set of measurements describing a physical object whatever we have discussed that it is exactly similar to this and uh, the then what is the goal of this is what pattern is and how patterns look like so everyone uh, whatever i've shown in this particular slide whatever you are seeing on the screen everyone forms a pattern right and the first one is a very famous pattern like handwritten characters and you know how uh, how important it is to recognize the scanned handwritten documents and auto reader is a, a company who has been successfully applying some of the pattern recognition machine learning algorithm to solve the problems and uh, so if you see here so by mostly uh, the, in this particular uh, you know figure handed and characters i have mentioned there are some uh, you know the a i mean i, mean, I have only represented a in small letter and capital letter and the one a is there which looks like q right so it is sometimes even difficult for us to recognize whether it is a or some other you know uh, other character so the major goal of pattern recognition is here to enable the machine that should understand what we are seeing what we are speaking what we are listening what you are sensing right so we want to build a machine and this is this is nothing but the ai dream and that we we make our system as much intelligent as much as intelligent we are and we know how much intelligent we are and i will also test your intelligence just after this slide i'll ask you one question and now the question is what is that intelligence and where does that intelligence come from and uh, that that i will discuss that what exactly that intelligence is so before that i will simply show you that the what is pattern recognition and we have already discussed right and uh, as i mentioned that we want the machine to do the task so again uh, we will, and this particular workshop is dedicated to image related problems so i will also focus mostly on the image part and uh, the question here is whatever we are seeing that cannot be you know directly understood by the machine you all know that and for that what we have to do is we have to represent the pattern present inside the images of the videos in the form of i mean in such a form that that the machine can easily understand right so with that means what i have to do now i have to represent each and every image of the data by means of some descriptor some properties or some features and those features should be arranged in a particular fashion and we call it as a feature vector here and we'll be discussing what is a feature and what is feature vector and what is a feature space as well so but, but here also there are some definitions which have taken from somewhere if you can read it out that pattern recognition have already talked about what is the goal of the pattern recognition and here is also one of the goal is written over here is the classification of objects into different categories also there are some other tasks that can be done using pattern recognition this is one of the uh, problem which is being currently solved by pattern recognition so if you look at the definition the pattern recognition which is written below is the study how machines can observe the environment learns to how machine can learn to distinguish the pattern of interest so the main motivation here is to the main motive is to simply make our machine intelligent right and uh, to 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 know what exactly intelligence is 
and the origin of the pattern recognition and machine learning, whatever we're talking about now it is, the origin actually lies in the very early efforts of understanding the intelligence. If you can understand the intelligence and how you are applying, how, how you are acquiring the knowledge and applying the knowledge in the real life, then it will be easier for you to understand what exactly pattern recognition problems are doing. I mean, the algorithms are uh, you know, doing. And for that, I have a very simple example. And I must ask you one question over here. If you can see on my screen here, there are two different images, very well-known images, you know. And uh, if I simply ask you a question, can you recognize these two images? The answer will be obvious. Yes, sir, I know that. Why are you asking this type of nonsense question to me? So my question here is, yes, you can recognize these images. So my question is, have you ever asked yourself, how do you recognize it? The question is, how do you recognize it? Have you ever asked yourself? So the answer is, actually the answer is, you have experienced this type of patterns before in your life, right? Either your parents, have, I mean, your parents have shown these type of images. The left one is very obvious. The left image, which is there on my screen right now, is nothing but the Statue of the Unity, which is there in Gujarat, we all know. And it's nothing but the statue of Sada Balabhai Potil. And the right one is nothing but the statue of Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. So now the question is how we recognize it. So is there any, I mean, uh, previous information with us already? Yes, with us. So that means maybe in the childhood, your parents have shown this type of pictures, or you might have visited that place where that statue is there, or you might have gone through some newspapers or papers or some you know, blogs of where these images you have seen in the lifetime, or maybe you have met Dr. Abdul, 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 Abdul Kalam in your lifetime. So that means you have experienced these type of patterns before, and at that time what happened, unknowingly some patterns are already embedded on the brain, and that is and unknowingly. So whenever you are seeing some new objects in the world, the knowingly or unknowingly sometimes the patterns are embedded in our brain and the god has given us the power that intelligence that next time when i see this picture so i can easily able to map right now whenever i see this picture i'm simply extracting or deriving some of the characteristics or descriptors immediately with a very small tag and uh, what i'm doing is simply matching with the patterns whatever is already there in my brain and simply it matching this, yes, uh, yes, this is nothing but the image of Sardar Balakai Potter. So that's what, and this is what intelligence is. All the time you are acquiring knowledge, acquiring knowledge from the experience, from the examples you are seeing. In the similar way, we design, we want to design a machine where the machine, where the intelligence, I mean, you want to put the intelligence based on the, based on the, uh, you know, some uh, algorithms, we call it as a machine learning or pattern recognition algorithm, and which are pretty different, which are uh, uh, totally different from the uh, you know, uh, programming language, what we know exactly C and C++. So it will ask you one simple question, one more simple question to you. So can you write a C program to recognize these two pictures? Can you write it? Is it possible to write? No, it is not possible. Why? Because even we don't know what to write. Right, and we don't know how it is done our brain, right? So sometimes it is very, very difficult. Even if you may, you may try to write some code, but it may take a long time, very, very long time, and you may not be come up with a good solution. That's what it is. So that is where the pattern recognition algorithms and machine learning, machine learning algorithms are important. And then and, and the people are always talking about, you know, uh, but, but what is that uh, machine learning, pattern recognition, both words like deep learning, and there are several other terms people are using nowadays. Just for now, you remember one thing, if somebody uh, uh, wants to ask you, I mean, what is the basic difference between machine learning and pattern recognition? Just machine learning is a solution, is a solution, but pattern recognition is a problem, right? So we will definitely use the concept of machine learning in the, while designing the pattern recognition system. So even deep learning people sometimes call the pattern recognition system as a machine learning system. That I uh, think other speaker will discuss more about it. And what is the difference between deep learning and machine learning? And uh, when to apply machine learning given a data? So how will you know that uh, whether you should go for machine learning or whether you should go for deep learning? So there are various different you know properties that they are in machine learning as well as deep learning that you will. We definitely other speakers will discuss to you and coming to the applications 
in some of these successful applications, if I want to show you over here, is the main successful application is document image analysis. We all know that optical character recognition. So I've already been, I mean, already been successfully applied for English language and some of the other languages, but still it's a challenge for Indic languages, right? Because Indic languages are a little bit difficult. It has a lot of characters, comparatively a lot of characters than the English language. So this still, it has been a long-standing problem. People are working, and there are various problems related to document image analysis. Still, people are solving. This is one of the successful applications we all know. And even uh, if you go to, uh, I mean, uh, U.S. Uh, postal system, they are using the concept of OCR to sort uh, the mails, whatever they are receiving. And uh, one more, uh, I, I cannot discuss all right now because you have to focus on other things. So one of the important one is natural language processing. And uh, the most important, the most vital application in pattern recognition is very successful. You people are every day using biometric recognition, right? Yeah, every day you are using biometric, fingerprint biometric, you are giving as uh, for the authentication purpose. And maybe, maybe, and whenever you have also uh, registered for Aadhaar card, I hope you remember that you have given two types of, two different modalities, right? Biometric modalities. One is iris and one is fingerprint. So this is the scenario right now that uh, how to combine all those biometric modalities to come up with a very good biometric and robust biometric system. So medical is one of the very vital applications of pattern recognition, how to design a computer at a diagnosis system. So I will also show you in detail the applications. And there are also some applications related to remote sensing, industrial automation. So this is but uh, one of the applications. So we should not discuss more about it. Everybody knows how important it is when you write. I mean, when uh, when it is uh, the task to you know recognize the handwritten words and handwritten characters, basically. And as I already mentioned, that it is very difficult even for some of the Indian languages till now. So uh, 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 and coming to again the Chinese handwritten recognition, everything seems to uh, you know similar to us, and it is very difficult sometimes even for us. For them, might be it is easy, but for us, it is very very difficult if we are solving this problem. That how will you distinguish that which one is which character? So again, and coming to the biometric application, you can see over here. So that uh, the first one is nothing but a fingerprint, which is uh, the fingerprint image. So uh, as I mentioned, that in biometric people are right now trying to fuse. I mean, different different biometric modalities to come up with a very good or a robust, you can say, reliable biometric system. But till now, the two successful biometric uh, modalities are fingerprint and uh, you know iris. Uh, which you have already experienced while you have uh, registered for the Aadhaar card. And uh, the people have also used later, I mean, uh, the uh, FESH, uh, I mean, the FESH. And the second uh, people are right now, you know, by using some year biometrics. And one very interesting paper I read a few days ago that they are calling it as a leap biometric. I don't know how it is working. But uh, there are various types of, uh, you know, uh, modalities are there in the literature. If you want, you can fuse them and you can because several works have already done in unimodal uh, biometrics. So you can read it, and if you want to make a career, also it is also good. And uh, coming to the autonomous navigation, so uh, it has been also uh, you know, successfully applied in some of the you know, states in the US, and uh, uh, mostly Mercedes-Benz is working towards this particular work. And uh, one of my students is also uh, uh, working in that particular project. Mercedes-Benz, so really they're doing good, and it is very difficult for Indian roads. You all know that. Why? And uh, uh, but it has been successfully applied, and still people are trying to make it more intelligent. And uh, coming to the can, uh, you know, uh, medical image analysis problem, so cancer detection is a very, very uh, important thing nowadays. And there are some issues or some weaknesses in the manual interpretation, which is uh, being done by the radiologists and the doctors. So I am not saying that we will replace the doctors over here. So I must say here we will assist the doctors by the help of or by designing a computer added system with the help of image processing and machine learning or deep learning algorithms. So uh, what we can do is we can we can reduce their burdens, their workload, during, particularly in this type of pandemic situation. I will show you one interesting example, and this is nothing but you know kind of uh, you know blood cells, uh, microscopic data. So from where you can uh, find out whether there is a blood cancer is there or not. So uh, that means again, uh, this is a kind of pattern, and again you have to extract some descriptor from it and to pass it to some, uh, I mean, to classify it, to classify it whether this is, I mean, whether this is a cancer type or non-cancerous type. So everywhere you will see pattern, whatever I'm showing you, everywhere you will see pattern, and this is a very recent one which we have been working since last couple of months. That uh, chest X-ray radiography, which it has been proved that till date the golden standard method is RT-PCR method in order to find 
uh, whether the person is a COVID uh, diagnosed, I mean COVID-19 positive or not. But uh, just after one month of this, you know, or two three months of this uh, Corona, I mean COVID-19, of this pandemic. So people uh, reported, I mean, the researchers have re reported that the chest radiography images also play very very important role in diagnosing COVID-19. So uh, there are various data sets even uh, they released and it has been uh, you know in, I mean they have been including images day by I mean every day and uh, but what they told is there are some there are some manifestations or radiological indications you will find in the chest X-ray images but there are some patterns I can say in the radiological I mean uh, chest X-ray images you will find I mean not only the chest X-ray images even CT scan is better than this but we all know that x-ray is a cheaper one compared to ct scan and it is faster as well so that's why uh, most of the researchers are preferring this chest x-ray over the ct scan and uh, the, the most important radiological indications if you can see over here the first image the first image sample is nothing but uh, chest x-ray image where you can easily see uh, the lungs right in black color because uh, actually the x-ray images of the prince there is principle behind x-ray images why it is looking sometimes white sometimes you know gray and sometimes black because it depends upon the amount of x-ray observations I mean the radiation observed by different tissues and the bones actually observe the most of the x-rays I mean the radiation so that's why it looks white and then the other sub tissues observes the less so that's why it looks sometimes gray and the AR observes the least so that is why it looks black and you know the lungs are full of you know AR so that's why it looks black and, and you can clearly see the boundaries of the lungs as well but if you look at the second picture over here, which I've shown, so the second picture is nothing but a chest X-ray image from a patient who is suffering from pneumonia, right? And pneumonia is, is uh, having similar type of manifestations with COVID-19. And if you can see here, uh, there are something, some cloudy, uh, white, uh, fuzzy kind of thing you can see over here. And uh, this is sometimes called as bilateral uh, ground glass opacities. And the most bilateral ground glass opacities you will find over in the last picture. And also there is something called as pulmonary consolidation, the solid kind of things you will find. And you sometimes you cannot even recognize the boundaries of the lungs. So it is very, very uh, difficult and it is mostly appeared in the lower lobe of the chest, I mean the lungs. So, so this type of pattern, the major challenge here is you know, uh, indicating, I mean classifying or recognizing the patterns but distinguishing the pattern between normal and COVID-19 is okay. But how, if the question is, the, the classifying normal viral pneumonia and COVID-19, here is the challenge lies in because you will find some images which is, I mean, from the uh, pneumonia category, which is having a very similar category. So we call it is a large interclass similarity. I will also explain this, what is this large interclass similarity with another example of computer vision. And but, the, but, but now you can just remember here, this is a very current problem. And uh, basically, I, uh, what we have seen is, I, we are not sure whether this is going to work properly or not, but lots of researches have been done. But what we can do at least is this RT-PCR method, whatever we are following right now is a very uh, you know, manual process, time consuming and complicated process. It takes a lot of time to give you know, the report. So what you can at least do is you can send the patient which is, who is having some symptoms to the X-ray scanning and you know it will take 10 minutes to get the report. And within the 10 minutes, at least you can decide, later you can verify the, RTPCR that whether this is a really, I mean, whether this my model is giving correct result or not, but at least we can decide whether the person should go for quarantine or not. That's it. So, uh, so it's very, very important to extract or to derive these meaningful patterns from this type of uh, medical images, and you can also build a CAD system, as I already mentioned. So, there are also several different types of you know. Uh, a CAD system you can design for diagnosing different types of diseases and coming to the land cover classification you have to tell that where there is a land where there is a tree and it is also kind of you know satellite image classification problem which is coming under pattern recognition uh, applications and also there is another one you have to if you want to you know class again as I said satellite data classification problem building and building group recognition and uh, this is one of the you know very very important applications related to OCR as well and license plate recognition so very very important even some of the smart cities in India they have uh, I think uh, they are using this type of technologies to indicate the malicious activities so uh, very very important this is also one of the very important and successful applications of pattern recognition but people are still solving it because there are a lot of challenges in it and uh, the clustering of the microarray data is one of the also 
a challenging problem we have. And coming to uh, you know one particular problem, just I want to show you that, and after that I will discuss that what are the different steps in a pattern recognition system we should follow. And uh, just 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 uh, let us now discuss uh, what is a feature and how to represent it. What can be a feature for a particular problem? So let us discuss uh, one problem over here, which I have taken from the Duda Hart book, which is one of the most famous book in pattern classification. And uh, what it says is the what is the problem is here. The problem is simply uh, that there is actually fish packaging company, and they want to automatically do I mean packaging based on the categories, right? And there are they assume that there are. Uh, two different types of fishes, one is sea bass and salmon, and uh, we want to uh, simply classify or categorize uh, these two types of images, and based on that, we'll be, they will make their packages. And uh, now the question is, what can be the different types of features, because sometimes fishes looks alike, so then how will you distinguish between two fishes? So there must be some, you know, patterns, uh, you know, distinguishing uh, pattern, or uh, discriminant pattern uh, present uh, in both of the categories by which and we can also recognize by ourselves and the same thing we have to provide to the machine that this should be the feature by which the machine can also easily take the decision yes so this this should go for this packet and go by this packet so uh, what could be uh, what could be the different types of uh, information i mean the features is like length maybe length maybe the size of one fish is bigger or um, in general in general and uh, maybe width maybe weight uh, and maybe sometimes number of steps maybe i'm not saying that these are the you know uh, relevant features or distinguished or discriminant features and uh, these are the just you know, possible features what we can consider but uh, in general uh, we have structured let's say we're applying some algorithms feature extraction algorithms and uh, sometimes say we may we know that one feature is not sufficient to you know solve a real life problem so we may need the help of maybe 100 features maybe 1000 features and later on we found that no no, no um, you are not getting some good accuracy because of the complexity of the model maybe at that time the number of features are high and and uh, there are some features which are not relevant and there are some features which are as well as redundant. So what you have to do is you have to I mean you have to remove those type of features by using some techniques people used to call as a feature selection or feature reduction algorithm. Then we'll discuss later on. But for now, you just see that what are the different types of features that is possible to to, to solve this problem. And definitely, you might uh, you know see some problems related. Well, uh, you will design the model. So maybe the, your your model can face some input. Um, uh, where there will be uh, you know, some lighting condition problem, some illumination problem, or position of the fish also. Maybe you may not uh, find that um, when full image of the fish. So maybe there are some noises present. So uh, this is what uh, you may face in real time. So that's a pre-processing is a major step in a pattern recognition problem. If the data is are contaminated by noise or the data are of low contrast especially images and at that time what you will do is you, you need to pre-process the image in order to extract actually vital features from the images otherwise in presence of the noise if the method if the feature extraction method or whatever you will be using if it is not robust towards noise then it will be a problem for the model right and uh, so uh, anything can be a feature that like I met and it's a feature man and he told me that uh, no no the sea bus is generally longer than salmon so it may be a feature but we cannot guarantee that with this only one feature you can you can uh, you know uh, distinguish um, and classify whether the, the fish is a sea bus or salmon but similarly similarly you can also consider an example uh, let's say task of classifying cat and tiger there are some features which looks very similar in, in uh, cat and tiger and you know there are some features and you already know you you have already applied your intelligence and if i show you thousands of cat of different categories you can easily recognize this is cat this is not a tiger and even i will also show you thousands of many varieties of tiger that you can be able to recognize but the machine it is actually difficult so that's what we are trying that uh, we are trying to uh, put as much as intelligence in the machine as possible and uh, as i mentioned that uh, maybe the uh, feature uh, whatever we are considering right now the length is not sufficient it was a one dimensional value right now my feature is a two dimensional vector and which contents you can see in the screen which is nothing but x1 and x2 and these x1 and x2 is nothing but a point in a two dimensional space and that's why this is called as a feature space i hope you all have understood the concept of feature vector and that this feature vector can be of any dimension can be of d dimension can be of thousand dimensions and at that time that will be a point in the thousand dimension 
So very important. And uh, so what is the job of, uh, I mean, let's say we have extracted some of the features from those images, uh, but these images. So next, uh, our job uh, of the recognition algorithms is to, you know, there are variety type of recognition algorithms are there. Let's say I'm considering a two different types of, you know, uh, features. So that's why I can visualize the features because it's a two dimensional feature. I can easily show you the features, but in real life, you'll find more than two number of features. At that time, feature visualization is a difficult thing, but data visualization itself is a, a research domain so you can work on that problem also what is data visualization and how can we visualize the data all the time because once we visualize you can easily take the decision right but it is not that possible to always visualize the data because if the data is of high dimension so here if you see the one of the you know recognition algorithm here the job of the recognition algorithm so if you can see the points over here there are some black dots there are some red dots i've shown and the black dots uh, the forms a single cluster over here and and uh, and this black dots are nothing but uh, you know the samples which belong to salmon class and those red red dots are nothing but uh, the samples which belong to sea bass class so what i exactly want to do and what a machine learning algorithm or a pattern recognition algorithm do here is simply it will draw a straight line over here and uh, telling it, uh, I mean, it is a straight line over here because the data is a two-dimensional data. If it is a multi-dimensional data, we generally call it as a hyperplane, right? And if you see the major goal is to simply draw a hyperplane by which you can decide. And this hyperplane will definitely be decided. And this may be outcome of the neural network or support vector machine or of any algorithm which is related to discriminant function analysis. And the job here is to simply distinguish the patterns of, and, and, and you have to, remember one thing over here that this this uh, this hyperplane is is nothing but the output of the training model any any training model let's say you are using neural network and this is nothing but the output of the neural network model what is the job here the job is to simply classify whatever a new let's say a new sample will come key over here so now it is your job to classify whether this category or that category based on this this boundary whatever you have you know designed based on the machine learning algorithm so uh, and and and, uh, and there are varieties also. But this this is this looks like there are also several misclassifications. So how can you uh, tell that this is a good decision boundary? So to decide whether it is a good decision boundary or not, there are also several concepts of you know overfitting and all this. And if you can see, this is a this looks very good, right? This this if you can see, not a single not a single sample are misclassified. And this has been uh, you know designed using the training set. So we all know what is a training, what is a testing. Also, I will discuss the later part of my discussion. And if you can see, this uh, is look. This looks like a very uh, difficult, uh, you know, distant boundary. And and the, the more you train, the more complexity will be there. And definitely, uh, definitely, you will get this type of, uh, you know, distant boundary. But this type of distant boundary is very, very good for the training set, but not good for the testing set. So we call it as a overfitting problem. And the generation performance in case of overfitting is a is very problem i mean at that time you will find some generation error so the best way is to you know uh, handle the overpitting problem there are some conventional methods so i would say that this is the best vision boundary the best possible uh, you know vision boundary where yes there are some you know misclassifications in the training set but you will get mostly good result on the training set so there is a trade off always uh, and, and uh, there are various ways to you know uh, handle the overpitting issues and basically overpitting uh, you know occurs when the number of you know variables or the parameters are more than the number of samples when the model is a bit complex at that time overpitting generally occurs and uh, to handle this problem there are some conventional methods and you can if you want to know more about it, you can go through those uh, you know what is overfitting and what is uh, you know underfitting and sometimes it is called it's over training and training as well and coming to the pattern recognition system, if you can see over here, look at the right hand side first, that what we are having is always a data set, right? Or a set of images. So what we generally do is, we generally divide the images or the data into two different parts, training and testing, but there is something called as validation. And that uh, we'll discuss later on that, what is validation and what is the importance of validation. Uh, so just just for now we remember that we generally divide the data into two parts what that is nothing but training and testing and training data is basically used to build the model to build the model and we cannot and we, we should not we should not pass a single sample from the training set during the learning why because otherwise it, the model will remember it and it will so sometimes it happens uh, that the students comes to me and tell sir i'm achieving 100 percent results on a real life problem. So you'll be surprised sometimes. Okay, it's fine. But can you explain me? 
So now this is now that, that that is why there is a you know topic which is coming nowadays is called the explainable AI, right? Explainable AI. So you have to explain that why this result is coming. So when I go through when I went through that uh, particular code, I saw that what the boy did was they combinedly you know train the model on both the training set and the testing set and again he is uh, providing the testing set to the model those data is already seen i mean the questions the final i mean the final questions have already been provided uh, during the you know class test or uh, then then i am then i am expecting something from the you know students that uh, yeah he may i mean i mean he may go, do good uh, in the examination, the final examination. So, but the questions were already given, and you all know what should be the answer. I mean, what should be the output, and that's what. So, it, it, you have to be very, very careful whenever you are dividing the data and passing the data to the model. So, as I already mentioned, if you can see that uh, the first stage is nothing but a pre-processing stage, and we all know the importance of the pre-processing stage. We have already discussed, and the most vital stage is nothing but the feature extraction stage. And sometimes uh, we may need the help of the feature selection, as I mentioned. If some features you found that uh, they're not relevant, and there are some methods to found whether each way you can also test each feature with respect to the class level. There are some filter based methods, there are some wrapper based methods for feature selection. So, there you can see um, that how who, who are the features who are really useful for this problem. So, based on that, you can select the features. But the thing is that which type of feature will work for your model, that is the major concern over here. Let's say you are solving a brain tumor classification problem, then what should be the feature for this problem? How will you know? Let's say there are 100 types of feature instruction algorithms are already there in the literature, and then which one will be fit for your uh, model, I mean, will fit for your problem. So, again, based on the expertise and some you know investigation, you can, you can decide that. And that's why people are right now using deep learning algorithm to avoid this type of problems. And uh, then after you have derived some features, meaningful features from this, so then finally what you will do is you will learn the model, the recognition model. And the model is already trained. And uh, the, the model is already trained, let's say, and it is giving really a good performance during training. So now it's the time to, 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 to pass the testing sample and to, to follow the similar procedure because you have to extract the same features, whatever you are extracting from the training set and the model, whichever is already there. So next time, what you will do is simply, uh, uh, you will apply those model, the trained model on this and, and, and you will find and you will, you will take the decision accordingly. So this is what the pattern recognition system is. Uh, and then let us move forward to the some part of the you know pattern recognition uh, which is uh, very very important and uh, as i mentioned that i should also discuss one uh, what is that uh, one uh, yeah one algorithm so let me start uh, my second part of the discussion i hope uh, you find uh, uh, my session interesting uh, yeah PPT is oh, okay initially. Okay. Ma'am, am I audible? And my can you please confirm? Me? Yes, yes, sir. It is uh, audible Clearly. and visible also. Clearly audible. Is it going fine? Everything? Yes, sir. Yeah. So let me uh, start my second part of the discussion, which is nothing but machine learning for pattern recognition. What are the different types of learning algorithms? We are using for recognizing the patterns and here we will see very very interesting problems some of the interesting problems i mean challenging problems as well and uh, uh, as well as we will discuss one algorithm and followed by some demonstration of the you know pattern recognition problem that's it and uh, yeah so but these are the prerequisites uh, whenever you are learning some machine learning algorithm you know so you have to learn uh, the mathematical concept behind Some little bit of idea about linear algebra. I hope you all have undergone, you know, one VTEC course uh, at least. I mean, the undergraduate course in linear algebra, probability theory, statistics. These three are very, very important. And today also we will use the concept of probability theory to understand the algorithm. So, and there is a programming language, whether it is MATLAB, Python, doesn't matter. R doesn't matter. The important thing is. The important thing is the logic, right? And the implementation part. So in machine learning and pattern recognition. 
So you have to implement. So please avoid using uh, functions as much as possible. Try to code by yourself. Whatever we will discuss today also, please try to code it by yourself. So you will definitely feel satisfied that yes, I have done something and this is my code and I have written the code from the scratch. That's what the satisfaction you will get if you write without using the functions and sometimes and then what uh, what the benefit of the, uh, if you write your own code, you can modify uh, uh, whenever you want. But whenever you are using somebody else function, then you cannot modify even the arguments. So you have to use the same argument and same thing, whatever they have provided. So very, very important to know uh, at least a little bit, you should have a little bit idea regarding linear algebra, probability theory and statistics to understand this concept. And this is what we have already discussed. So a lot of things that how machine learning and what are the different types of machine learning models, which are there have been used for recognizing patterns. And this is what one of the definition of machine learning, if you can see, I've taken it from somewhere provided by Samuel in 1959 that it is nothing but a field of study that gives computer the ability to learn from the experience without being explicitly programmed. We may not write a, like C programs or and here the program is totally different from those other programs. Here maybe your program contains millions of numbers, right? And like whenever you are training a model, I mean whenever you are writing a code for neural network or for deep learning, you know how many parameters it is having. So but maybe this program will look like totally different from the other programs. It may contain billions of parameters. And the below figure, which is there on your screen right now, just to show you that there are some relations between the terms, whatever is currently being used widely, is pattern recognition, machine learning, data analytics, data mining, AI, deep learning. If you can see over here, there are some intersections with, uh, this is a kind of hand diagram if you can see, and uh, there are some kind of introduction, I mean, sorry, intersection uh, between uh, these different different types of field. So coming to the learning algorithms, uh, but there are various types of learning algorithms which are being used. And uh, so I have listed out only two, those who are popularly uh, known as supervised learning and unsupervised learning, and there is something called reinforcement learning and semi-supervised learning as well. And, uh, but the, 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 these two are actually popularly you know, known and uh, widely used. Uh, you know, learning algorithms and uh, in, 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 in supervised learning, classification and regression are the both uh, are the different problems which have been solved. And why it is called a supervised learning, if you can see, I have even mathematically uh, shown here that in at this particular value, we are designing a supervised learning algorithm. At that time, class level, the output level should be there. So with the help of the output level, you will design the model. I mean, you will... Uh, design the algorithms. So here the, there will be one teacher who will guide you that yes, you are doing the wrong things or you are, you are doing correct things. And based on that, you can find the error and in neural network, neural network also you can propagate the error and whatever you want to do, you can check whether the model is working correctly or not. And you can solve also classification problem and regression problem. And uh, um, as a classification problem, we have already seen one type of classification problem just now. And regression problems can be of different types or like if you want to predict the dollar values for tomorrow, then what you will do. And if you want to predict whether, uh, whether about the rainfall in Jeju. So then you can also uh, use some regression techniques, machine learning, or supervised learning, um, best regression techniques. And uh, there is something of uh, financial forecasting. A lot of things are being done using regression techniques. But the major difference between the classification uh, and uh, regression is the output values of the classification models are always discrete levels. And maybe it is one, two, three in numeric numbers, or sometimes it is alphanumeric, or sometimes it is only in words that it is normal or abnormal. It is discrete. Okay, but in regression, you know, it should be real values because you don't know what what will the value of the dollar for tomorrow and day after tomorrow. So that's why that this is the basic difference between the classification and regression is, and here we require the help of the output levels to design the model. So coming to the unsupervised problem, and we have, I think the very well done problem is clustering. Here I will I will definitely air or discuss discuss this with one example. So it take only one minute to explain all these things. And uh, the just clustering is one of them. And one more is dimension reduction. So not all I will tell in bracket. So that means not all the dimension reduction techniques are coming under this category. And there are some dimension reduction uh, techniques which are falling under supervised uh, learning uh, categories. And if you look at uh, this particular picture, it is very simple to understand. And um, that the first uh, uh, picture which is shown on your screen right now, the first one is simply you know the the, the image is I mean the task is to simply classify the images and provide a label to each of the images, right? And if you can see, 
all our dog images except one the last one is a cat image over here and simply way to provide the class level the thing is here there are a lot of challenges again because the the first dog and the other is a and the second dog both looks very different to each other but still we can able to recognize again the toy and the thing is to how machine will recognize that both are dogs that's what the challenge is and uh, coming to the second problem on supervised is a bit difficult problem because there will be no output levels given to you so you have to find out the similarity among the data and based on that there are a lot of uh, you know clustering algorithms in the literature if you and many people are also working in this particular field on supervised machine learning algorithm if you want you can go through the algorithms like i mean clustering there are a lot of clustering algorithms and other types of unsupervised learning algorithms are there even pca a principal component analysis is a dimension reduction techniques but it is called as unsupervised machine learning algorithm because we don't require class level to reduce the data at that time so here are some of the examples if you can see of the supervised learning algorithms and unsupervised So NAP bias, scan, yes, never all the classification techniques, and uh, some are based on NAP bias, some are based on scan, yes, never. So I mean, yes, never. Some are based on probability, some are based on discriminant analysis, like some of the vector machine and neural network, which basically draws hyperplane in order to classify the classes, different different categories. There is something called as decision tree, which basically is a tree-based structure, and in unsupervised, I have mentioned only two, three over here, and there are. other varieties as well so the difference the structure if uh, the pattern recognition system structure in case of supervised learning if you can see initially you will be provided some data and from the data what you will do is you will simply extract the features there is a first stage and here i have omitted there are others you uh, know intermediate stages like pre processing i have only shown the major you know two major stages like feature extraction as well as classification so if you can see that uh, the this in this picture you labels are provided to the model and and uh, what we are doing is we are simply you know generating i mean we are, we are training the model based on the data so labels as you can see labels are only useful whenever you are designing machine learning algorithm so that means these features whatever you are extracting are called as hand crafted or hand engineered features by the deep learning researchers why because we are people who is deciding i mean who are deciding that what type of features will extract from the images or the, from the input so and and this features are not updated in response to the output so that's why uh, only labels we are providing to the you know machine learning algorithm here but in deep learning the case is different so at that time we are updating and the features uh, and in response to the output so that's the uh, major characteristics you know one of the vital characteristics of deep learning algorithm and uh, if you can see next time there was the model is trained again uh, for testing as shown in uh, the different different green color arrow marks you will follow the same procedure you have to extract the same features then the model is already trained you have to provide the features to the model the model will decide that whether i mean will provide the predicted level so uh, if, if you see the difference between unsupervised and supervised learning if you can see the only one difference the major difference here is that class levels are not here okay and uh, this is what the supervised uh, classification algorithm the discriminant based classification algorithm does it generally what it does is it generally draws a hyperplane if the data is a two dimensional if multi dimensional it is hyperplane so uh, i will right now show you very very i mean so a few uh, some of the interesting examples uh, to you uh, and uh, yeah this is we have already discussed right this type of image classification problem seems very easy because it seems a four class classification problem if you can see as a four class classification problem and it is nothing but any mal classification problem any mal image classification problem I, i will just highlight some some of the you know challenges over here and here if you can see the challenges is in the first row you can see there are five different images of tigers right and every tiger if you see even color wise they are different position wise also different in different different images but how intelligent we are we can easily by the first you know whenever we are seeing it and we can easily we can easily recognize yes this is a tiger again the question is then what kind of features in the third image of the tiger if you can see the whole part of the tiger is not there. only one part is there so then can you then what type of pattern you will or what type of descriptor you will you will generate from these images to to distinguish that uh, this is a tiger always and uh, so uh, this is uh, this is a very small line of uh, classification problem four class classification this may be extended to maybe 10 100 maybe 1000 class. classification problem the more is a class again there will be definitely the more is the challenge 
And there is something called as image scene classification problem. If you can see over here, so that it looks very similar to each other, the scene image, the tall building. So you have to find out inside city. So there are some properties which are you know, similar in both the classes, if you can see. So and then how will you decide? Sometimes it is, sometimes we fail to decide that whether it is street or whether it is like highway or like that. So how will you decide? So coming to one medical imaging problem, which uh, today I will show you one demonstration that uh, uh, the same problem actually I will, uh, will solve today that uh, will be simply a binary class classification problem and you will be given a set of MR images of brain and this is nothing but the MR images of brain and the first or the images in the first one nothing but the MR images of a, MRI images of a healthy person and uh, the, the images which are there in the below are nothing but the MR images and basically it is there in the axial plane where actually majority of the characteristics are visualized and you can you can uh, I remember it as a top view top view it is nothing but the top view of our brain in terms of a 2d slice and uh, this, this depends upon again the setting of the parameters in the mri machine and uh, mri basically is very very important compared to x-ray and ct scan because it actually gives excellent resolution of the soft tissues present in the human brain and uh, as well as the most important thing is it does not involve any radiation or harmful radiations like x-ray uh, where uh, I mean, what X-ray and CT scan is using, and the most uh, the problem uh, here is, I mean, the major problem here is it is costly, right? And it takes some time to give the report as well. So that, as I mentioned, that the, uh, the uh, images are present uh, in the below row, if you can see, are nothing but the images of abnormal category. I mean, non-healthy category. I mean, the, those patients. I mean, uh, the images are taken from the patients who are those who are suffering from some varieties of brain diseases, some kind of brain disease. And the major difference, actually, if you can see over here, you now all the normal brains, so the, there is something called as a you know, cerebrospinal fluid. You can see the structure in X. There is an X kind of you know, geometric structure present in the images of the first row. And if any kind of disturbance happens to this, then that person may, uh, may be caused by any type of, you know, uh, we cannot say directly that what type of brain disease it is, but that again, we need some other things and the properties as well other characteristics you have to combine but for this the, the, the measure actually changes you will find uh, in, the, in, in the in all the images which is given below is nothing but the uh, changes in the shape of the cerebrospinal fluid and the content of the cerebrospinal fluid so coming to one more challenge to explain you that what exactly large interclass similarity is so it, this is a problem in many when you will solve image classification problem then you will find this type of problem. What is that? Large interclass problem that I will show you. And this is a very, very interesting problem. And one of the interesting problems, if you can see, this is nothing but a food image classification problem. So now the question is why it is required, right? Why this food image classification is required? Yes, it is required. And uh, it has been explained clearly. Very few articles are published based on this. And uh, let's say I want, I, I want to automatically calculate that uh, how much nutrition I have consumed every day. So what I have to do is simply I have to capture some images of my food and simply I have to provide or I may fit a camera on my uh, dining hall and it will capture regularly. I mean at a regular interval it will capture whenever I will eat and uh, the, what it will do is it will calculate uh, calculate and calculate the nutrition at the end when you will go to sleep. Uh, but then, then, then it will decide and it will uh, tell or it will suggest or yeah, this much of nutrition you have consumed today maybe it is less or more then accordingly you can change your food tomorrow so this type of work has been done and people are still trying and in india we all know whenever you go to different different states the different types of foods are there right so we can also start some a project on it that uh, what important and how important it is this is one of the importance i told there are also various importance if somebody is coming from abroad and uh, know about uh, and visit some restaurant and he or she doesn't know about this food and she really want to know the name of this food and what what uh, she or he can do is he can simply capture the image and put it our up and uh, simply it will tell what is the you know about the name of this particular dish and what are the recipes so the, the various types of you know problems you will find related to this and this particular image whatever i've shown on the screen if you can see is nothing but food image classification problem and here the foods are very you know distinguishable and you can easily tell the first one is nothing but the image of banana second one is orange like an egg and like that you can easily distinguish because there is no such you know uh, uh, 
difficulties in detecting um, or in distinguishing the different different categories. So now I will show you one picture over here. So can you please distinguish this? This these are the two different types of coffees people are being consumed. At uh, coffee boy is a kind of coffee. Uh, I mean, uh, generally the, uh, the you know, uh, people in Singapore and Malaysia they used to consume. And this is called as coffee vo and American is a kind of coffee is being used in uh, United States. So now the question is how will you differentiate between this and this? It has exactly, it, it looks very similar to each other. It is, we will fail it, right? Sometimes here, uh, whether it is coffee or American. So this is called as large interclass. There will be interclass similarity. There will be interclass similarity, but large interclass similarity is very dangerous sometimes. Again, if I show you one more sample over here, so this, uh, I mean, uh, we, we, this is sometimes coffee, also if you add it with uh, you know, milk, then it will, the color will look like this, and the color of the tea also will look like the same. So then how will you distinguish whether it is a tea or coffee, both are different. So again, uh, there are a lot of challenges uh, actually in detecting, and I'm just showing you one example for this. I mean, food classification, and you will find this type of problem in many, many, many image classification problem. So uh, there will be again a large class interclass similarity. There are some more examples you can see over here. And again, if the food is incomplete, let's say you forget to capture the images, you forget to switch on your camera, and at last, oh, oh, oh I forgot to uh, switch on the camera, then what I will do right now is, so let us at least capture whatever is there left on my, you know, uh, plate. So, uh, so can it calculate right now? Big challenge. And uh, this is common. We have already discussed about it. This is common everywhere. The poorly taken photos, illumination will be there, rotation will be there, occlusion will be there all the time. And you have to design a model in such a way that this should it should be reversed towards illumination and this type of uh, uh, you know uh, problems basically. So this is one uh, you know type of problem where you can also start your research is very interesting as well and you can and, and why it is easy as well and you can collect your own data set by capturing the images or you can collect the images also from the google as well this is not the case of medical image where it is very very difficult to collect the data set because you know it sometimes takes two years to three years to collect even 50 or 100 samples you have to wait for the patients when they come you will only capture the images right so it is very very uh, compared to that it is rather easy to collect the data set for this type of problem because these are uh, real problems and, uh, and that it's not like the medical imaging problems and also there are some you know, problems if, uh, if yeah there are some situation you will find multiple foods which is actually required to calculate the limitation so at that time what i mean how you will calculate it and um, i will distinguish that uh, again you have to apply a lot of technologies here as to different different objects are there you have to first detect it and you have to again mention it then what type of object it is i mean what type of food it is so it is very very difficult sometimes because uh, the apples may be of different colors so this type of things uh, your, your models would handle uh, uh, so uh, this is what uh, some of the applications uh, all, about, I mean, all about the applications whatever we've discussed and uh, in the next uh, half an hour what i must discuss is nothing but a simple you know given a simple problem given a simple problem uh, and then uh, the simple problem is nothing but i will first show you the problem uh, this is one paper which I have collected from internet. I'm not saying this is a very uh, uh, top paper or very uh, uh, good paper like that. Just just to show you exactly how a pattern recognition problem is being implemented. Okay, so the problem here is as I already mentioned that we have to classify the brain images into two different categories, and uh, that is a uh, normal and abnormal. And uh, the, the features they have used is nothing but wavelet and trophy, right? I hope this part has been covered uh, uh, in the uh, previous HTTP as well. Those who have been, uh, those who have attended, uh, that what is uh, the meaning of wavelet and uh, what is image transform and what is the importance of working with the frequency domain rather than pixel domain and what is entropy as well and uh, what is and and, and and finally we will uh, they, they have used some classifier to classify. So they have been extracting. So I will directly show you. The one emails related to yeah, wavelet. So basically, wavelet is a, a kind of a feature extraction tool, you can say, and uh, mainly in the domain in frequency domain, and which has characteristics like the important characteristics compared to Fourier transform is it, it provides you know, time and frequency localization, which is beneficial for classification problem, as well as it helps 
to analyze the signals and here it is two times and signals and images at different scales and resolution which is very very important so even after the wavelet there are variants of wavelet like stationary wavelet flexible analytical wavelet a lot of wavelets have been developed uh, which are actually uh, even better than this wavelet and that is the, and those those wavelets can capture you know features in different directions as well and there is something called as corpulent contour let let a lot of image transforms came into the picture and that tries to uh, solve the i mean overcome the problem what uh, wavelet is suffering from but we are not focusing on it right now what we are focusing is simply how to extract features using wavelet and for now you just you remember wavelet is a feature extraction tool and it is there it is there uh, in the image processing it is an image transform technique it has a lot of advantages and when you apply it on the images it basically decomposes and it basically decomposes into four different components and these four different components you will whenever you will implement uh, this wavelet you will get to know that uh, if, uh, this wavelet if you want to implement then you, you need the help of the low pass filter combination of low pass filter high pass filter as well as some down sampler that will be applied on the rows as well as the columns of the images and finally you will get some you know when you will get some subbands or you can say subband images or components of uh, different of, of sizes of, uh, that depends on the size and depends on the type of wavelet you are considering here they have considered uh, uh, you know the hard wavelet i hope i hope so and that's why the, the size originally was 256 cross 256 whatever the image i have shown the mri images are of sizes i mean the number of rows in that particular image is 256 cross 256 and uh, uh, the decomposed images are of size 128 cross 128 and uh, the first decomposition the ll uh, one is called as actually uh, the approximation coefficient which contains the coefficients in the frequency domain sometimes people used to take directly these coefficients as the features and uh, here in this paper what they did is Simply they have divided, I mean they have decomposed the images at different different levels. In the next level, if you can see the LL part, the approximation coefficient, again divides into four parts. It generally approximation coefficient is decomposed in all the uh, levels, and again it is divided into four parts. Again, approximation level two, horizontal, uh, and uh, I mean this is called as sometimes horizontal component or these three components, uh, HL2, LH2, and HS2 are called as uh, you know detailed coefficients, mostly. It contains high frequency components, and uh, what they exactly did for feature extraction, they have not combined the features. I mean, they have not combined the coefficients from all these subbands. What they did is they simply calculate the entropy from different different subbands. So, how many subbands are there here in the second level? So, uh, they have uh, they have even proved that why they have considered two level decomposition, and uh, uh, yeah, so there are seven subbands. So if uh, the num if they will combine the, all the coefficients, there will be a huge number of coefficients, and the feature vector will be very very large. It will be 256 cross 256 around. But what they did is they simply apply the entropy as a kind of texture features. You all know the importance of the entropy from the information theory, and uh, you can also, if you want, you can take other features like energy standard deviation. There are a lot of uh, correlation. There are a lot of other features, and there is a paper. Uh, by Professor Harelik, Harelik is popularly known as the father of pattern recognition. And uh, Professor Harelik uh, has a paper uh, called Harelik Texture Features. So you can go through the texture features, and there are a lot of texture features defined in that paper. So it's a bit lucky that I met uh, such a person who has contributed uh, a lot uh, in this particular domain. And I had a, a nice discussion with him uh, for a long uh, half an hour in Bengaluru. So uh, I met him and I got inspired also, and uh, he has uh, discussed a lot of things about this feature extraction and this. And uh, after extracting the features, you can see, can, can you please tell me that what should be the size of the feature vector? That's a question from my side, that there are seven subband images, and from each subband, you want to extract one one value. So entropy of a particular matrix will definitely get a single value. And you all know the uh, formula of the entropy. And every time you will get, I mean, for each and every subband image, you will get one one value, and and then you will arrange it in, in in a fashion. We call it as a feature vector. So then, how many and what is the size of the feature vector? Can anybody please tell? What should be the size of the you know feature vector? I'm waiting for the response. That's thanks, please.
So till now, I have not received a single comment as well that how many features you will derive using this technique, whatever I've discussed right now. Can anybody please tell? Nobody has responded. Ma'am, uh, uh, Pooja, are you there? Yes, sir. Is my voice audible? Yes, sir. Your voice is audible, sir. Oh, it's strange. So nobody is replying, right? Okay, it's fine. Let me tell the answer by myself uh, that it, it should be seven, right? As I mentioned, that I have to uh, collect one one feature from. I mean, that, that feature is nothing but an entropy feature over here from each of the sub, and then it must be seven, right? And after that, what I will do is I have a feature vector over here for all the samples. I will calculate the similar I mean, the similar procedure. I will calculate for all the images. I will calculate the features, and then in this particular paper, in this particular article, what they did is they simply use a name bias classifier, right? Which is based on a Bayesian theory, probably probabilistic theory and which now I'm going to discuss and again I will come back to this point after discussing the Bayesian classifier and then I will show you the demonstration. So feature can be represented you know well, let's say we're solving for example we are solving a binary class classification problem and I want to represent feature in terms of factors and here you can see on my screen that how I expressed one feature vector is nothing but x is equal to x1, x2 up to xd. So that means d is the number of features per particular sample. And uh, that's why I have written over here r to the power d. And this, this is nothing but the real values because all, all, all features are actually real values. And we can also treat it as a random variable as well. So uh, the, this is how we represent the feature vector. And this system we've already discussed about pattern recognition. And there are some evaluation measures to evaluate the classification problem as well as the regression problem. So uh, there is something called as, you know, confusion matrix and error. And from uh, you know, that, you can calculate a lot of things uh, because confusion matrix contains, uh, you know, components like true positive, true negative, false positive and false negative. And by, by, by means of which you can calculate, there are several measures like sensitivity, specificity, uh, recall and precision, uh, uh, F1 score and CC accuracy, whatever you want, you can extra, you can, you can uh, obtain from that matrix. And uh, as I already mentioned that training and testing, what is training and what is testing, I should not discuss more about it, but the goal should be, the goal should be a design, a model that should perform well on both training as well as testing. It should be our goal, right? And uh, the errors are basically called as training error in case of training and testing error, it is called as testing. And the generalization is a very important one in order to test how the model is behaving on the unknown samples. If the model is really behaving, good then you can call that model is having a good generalized performance if the model is not behaving properly on the testing set then you can call it as the person is i mean that the model is suffering from some generalization problem we call it as a generalization error right so if the area so this is what we can uh, uh, see over here that we can conclude over here is the performance well on new data if the model performs well on the new data so you can call it as a good generalization the test area uh, was sometimes called as generalization error so coming to the Bayesian descent theory, so I mean, it is a kind of a we will discuss the Bayesian classifier, right? Bayesian classifier, and it is based on a probability theory, and that is nothing but a Bayesian, uh, a Bayesian descent theory, a Bayes theory. So I will show you uh, the you know, uh, and the equation which we have already studied in probability theory, and how uh, you can map the equation to solve uh, uh, a pattern recognition problem. That's what our main so, before that, I would like to discuss uh, within two to three minutes. I want to cover some fundamentals uh, of uh, this particular, you know, what is it, you can call it as a background which is required to understand the Bayesian classifier, a mathematical concept behind the Bayesian classifier. So, the data of a class, uh, the probability distribution function we are uh, talking about, as I already mentioned, that this is uh, what is based on the probability theory. So if you can see over here what I've written in blue text, the data of a class is represented by a probability distribution function. 
So that type of class can be represented by probability distribution function, and there is something called as probability mass function. But we are always talking about the real values and random variables. We can consider it a variable as or a feature as because the values are continuous, and for that probability distribution function is required to represent it. And uh, so one more point, if you can read it out. So for a class whose data is considered to be forming a single cluster, like uh, we have seen the data uh, in case of uh, sea bass and uh, salmon. We've seen also, I'll show you one example after this slide, that if the data forms a single cluster, it can be represented by Gaussian distribution and normal distribution. Again, the question is why we are only talking about this distribution in pattern recognition and machine learning. There are some advantages of this Gaussian distribution as well as normal distribution. So what are those advantages? And that advantages are nothing but lies in the particular theorem called the central limit theorem. So we don't know that whatever the features we are using and those features are coming from what type of distributions. But whenever you aggregate these variables, these random variables all together, so what will happen is, uh, the, I mean these independent variables all together, what will happen is it will always uh, change towards a normal distribution. So this is what central limit theorem says. And it is actually, and the second most important thing um, of uh, widely using this Gaussian distribution is the mathematical tractability. It makes the math easy and uh, like uh, calculating the moments, correlation between the features of the variables. So it is very, very important uh, the, to know that why Gaussian distribution is very famous in this particular domain. So as I mentioned that if the data, so here if you can see I have represent the data, I mean the two dimensional data, so that's why uh, I have uh, written, I, mean, I have shown it using you know, two different coordinates, I, x1 and x2. And if you can see, there are samples over here of three different categories, and I have given three different colors to represent uh, 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 the samples of each different class. And if you can see, there is something called the red, red squares are there, blue squares are there, and everyone is forming a cluster kind of thing. So th that means this has been distributed, I mean, I can assume that, yes, this is uh, being distributed, I mean, this, this is following Gaussian distribution. So, uh, and then uh, here I want to tell you one thing that every, every class, if you see the samples of every class, can you find the mean of every class? Yes, you can. And similar to that, can you find the variance of every class? Yes, you can. So that means every class is forming a cluster over here and every class is having its own mean and variance. That's what you have to remember here, that every class is having its own mean and variance, right? And coming to the uh, you know, univariate Gaussian distribution formula, if you see the formula over here, and it is very uh, well-known formula when you have been using since your childhood, and this is nothing but, you know, x is nothing but the input, and p of x is nothing but the probability distribution function. Sometimes we represent it as f of x, but here it is uh, p of x, I denoted as, and the formula is 1 by root over 2 pi sigma, uh, e to the power minus of x minus mu square and plus 2 sigma square. So here, um, there are only two different parameters which you can see. One is mu, which is called as mean, and one is sigma square, which is called a variance. And you all know how the uh, how the shape of the curve of Gaussian distributions looks like. It looks like always a bell shaped curve. And based on the you know, for this particular um, uh, graph, the mu value is like p20. Yes, and if it is zero, definitely the peak point will be at zero. And based on the, the sigma square where the variance value, the width of this will be changed. And this is particularly for a single. I mean, if the data is of single dimension, then only you can represent like this. But you all know that whenever you are going to solve a problem that here we have seen the problem is a seven uh, dimension problem because we have extracted already seven features, right? Seven features we have extracted. So, so you cannot uh, use this univariate Gaussian distribution formula. And there is an extension formula for multivariate Gaussian distribution. And here you can see what is this. Uh, multivariate Gaussian distribution formula and the multivariate Gaussian distribution formula, if you can see, um, which is nothing but 1 by 2 pi to the power d by 2, d is nothing but the dimension over here, dimension of the feature vector, 2 pi is a constant value, determinant to the power c, that is c. This is the only one thing which is different from that and c is a, when we are talking about a d-dimensional space or multi-dimensional space, so we cannot calculate, I mean, uh, we, we cannot calculate the simple variances, whether here we usually calculate covariance matrix. Okay, covariance and C is nothing but here covariance matrix, and this is uh, nothing but the two bars here representing the determinant. So, determinant of the covariance matrix, I will talk about covariance matrix later on. So, just for now, you see 
that uh, C, I'm going a little bit faster, I know, because I have to explain a lot of things as assigned by the organizers. And uh, that's why I'm going a little bit faster, but I hope ki you all can understand. This is not a very big thing to understand. You all know this is simply a formula I am explaining this formula, right? And uh, e to the power minus uh, 0.5 x minus mu transpose is a, x is a vector, right? Here x is a vector. X is a vector, feature vector. Mu is also a vector. And uh, C is a matrix, right? And uh, why x is, uh, x is a vector? Because we are talking about d-dimensional space. We are talking about the data in d-dimension. And mu should be also of the same dimension, d-dimension. Because you are calculating the, the mean of the different different features. And finally, you will definitely get a mu vector. Let's say the x is of size 1 cross d is a row vector. And mu also, let's say your 100 samples are there and you will calculate the mean. What will be the size of the mean? Definitely 1 cross 7 only. And uh, the important thing is what is covariance matrix over here. And then look at the covalence metric, how it looks like, and why it is a square and symmetric matrix. And let's say my data is of two dimensions. That's why I represented x as x1 and x2, and d as 2. So at that time, remember, always the dimension of the C matrix, and in the covalence matrix will be always a d cross a d. And here, if you see what I'm calculating is nothing but mu 1, and I mean sigma 1 square, the covariance of the first feature, first variable, and then the correlation between the first feature and the second feature, which is nothing but sigma of 1, 2 and then if you see here sigma of 2, 1 and sigma of 2 square so similarly if my d value will be 3 the size will be 3 cross 3 rather than 2 cross 2 and uh, if it is 4 uh, then the d is 4 then it will be 4 cross 4 as I mentioned that it should be always d cross d and uh, the, this is sigma 1, 2 and sigma 2, 1 are always same because this represents here the correlation between correlationship between the two different variables is called as features over here and it is same, so that's why it is a symmetric matrix. So I will show you also one example for that. And this is how the uh, how the surface uh, we have plotted and for the bivariate Gaussian, because this is the uh, maximum thing what we can do is uh, we can consider only uh, two, two, two dimensional samples and uh, we can plot it uh, in a surface. And as I already mentioned, the size of the mean vector should be one cross D if the data is of size d-dimensional and the size of the maybe sometimes it is d cross one but my approach is one cross d if you like uh, to represent features in columns that is also fine so i i used to re, sorry samples in columns i used to represent samples in rows different rows in my data set always uh, present uh, i mean indicates uh, the different samples and uh, the different i mean the features are always in the column so that is why so my 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 uh Assumption here is the mu, mu vector is nothing but one one cross d, and the c vector uh, I mean the c matrix the size of the c matrix will be always d cross d that you all know. So if I ask you one question, there is a problem over here. What I want, I want to calculate. So here also if I ask you the same question that given a x value, how can you calculate the p of x value? So just for that we need some mu value and sigma value. If you know mu value and sigma value, then you can apply the formula and get the output. So here also it is same. Mu value is given to us which is of same dimension of x1 and here there is a mistake it should be x2 if you can see it is not x1 and uh, the, the sigma value i mean the mu value is given and the covariance matrix value is given 1001 and what uh, we want to calculate here is simply the gaussian for probability value the probability distribution value at this particular point x1 so what you will replace in the formula is x will be replaced by x1 okay and mu will be replaced by uh, the 0, 01 and c will be replaced by 0, 1, 0, 0, 01 which is identity matrix the inverse is also same and uh, 2 pi is a constant value to the power d by 2 d is nothing but 2 because it is a two dimensional point and the value will be uh, 2 by 2 will be 1 and if you calculate so you have to be very very careful whenever you are calculating the exponential value over here because because it should e to the power some single value so if you start with 1 cross t 1 cross 2 then you will get you will end at 2 cross 1 over here so you have to be very very careful uh, in, in, in some of the you know um, some of the formula you can found x minus mu first then x minus mu transpose so you have to be very very careful whenever you are uh, writing code and the, the matrix size should match the dimension should match and uh, coming to the real uh, classification technique and uh, let us first uh, you know discuss let's say i am i'm going to solve the binary classification problem two class classification problem to categorize the images into two categories let's say normal and abnormal so for that what i have to do and how i will apply and what is the equation i will apply or what is the model of the bayesian uh, classification that uh, will help me to find out i mean to to predict 
uh, the class level. So if you can see the directly, so I'm going a little bit faster as I said that uh, but directly you can see the equation below capital P of C1 given X. So this is nothing but the bias, you know, the bias rule which is there in probability. And now we are, we are discussing uh, it. I mean, why we are discussing it? Because now we are going to solve a problem using this theory, right? And this Bayesian rule says that probability of C1 given X. So given X means uh, what you want to find out over here. And this one is called as posterior probability. So given a X, X is given to you and you don't know the class level for this. That means this is a testing sample, right? And this is a testing sample. And in this testing sample, uh, for, 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 for X, you want to assign a class level and it's a binary class classification problem. And simply you want to assign whether this model will uh, uh, belong to class one or class two. So what you have to do is if you look at the uh, equation which is there on the right hand side is nothing but small p x given c1 otherwise called as class conditional probability and likelihood sometimes called as and the, the, the important thing is this capital p of c1 which is called as prior probability which is known a priori and i will also explain how you will calculate from the given a training set and testing set how will you calculate this term this terms p of i mean likelihood as well as prior probability and the term which is there in the denominator if you can see p of x is nothing but a, a normalization constant which always yields a positive value right positive value and you know if you and it is used basically and it is used for all the classes and the same constant value if you use for all the classes, so you can ignore this. So just ignore this term P by X. And the, now the formula of what is remained is P of, I mean, the posterior probability of a problem. That means you want to predict a class level for X, given X for class one. So then what is your task over here? For a particular testing sample, you have to find out the posterior probability for both the classes as you are solving binary classification. And, and then how we will decide, then how we will calculate? And to calculate this, you have to calculate the, you know, uh, what is this, the likelihood as well as the prior probability. And how will you calculate the likelihood? Using this formula. So that's what I was discussing about and more focused on this formula. And this is what this likelihood is. And uh, whenever you are calculating for class one, you have to be very, very careful because I already told you that for each class, there will be a mean and there will be covariance matrix. So whenever you, are cal you will calculate, uh, with this value, I mean, probability of x given c1, and here, please don't uh, be confused, because the small c1, I am uh, here uh, representing the class levels, and the capital C is nothing but covariance matrix. So, uh, this one c1, and uh, so uh, while calculating this, we have to use, we have to replace mu by mu1, I mean, this is nothing but the mean of the class 1, and c by c1. Similarly, whenever you will calculate this from a posterior probability of class 2, I mean, uh, given x, so what you will do is you will simply ignore that uh, denominator part and you will calculate and you will multiply these two values. And whenever you will calculate that mu will be replaced by mu2, c will be replaced by c2. So uh, then, 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 uh, right now, at least you got, I mean, some idea that how to implement this equation, right? And to implement this particular term, we need this equation. And to implement, I mean, this equation again needs two different parameters, mu1 and c1. So then from where you will calculate this mu and c1, I will explain it. And then how will you decide? How will you decide? I mean, uh, uh, given x value, and you, let's say you have already calculated the posterior probability for both the classes, then what should be the decision rule? And here the decision rule says that the, the, the posterior probability for which, I mean, uh, the posterior probability for which the value is maximum and that will be assigned to that class. I mean, uh, let's say you are having a test pattern x and the class for which the posterior probability is the maximum one. So based on that, you will assign the you know, sample to the classes. So here, for example, if you can see that uh, if the posterior probability of class one is greater than class two, so definitely the next will belong to class one. Otherwise, it belongs to class two. This is the decision rule. And this can be easily extended to multi-class classification problem. So at that time, you have to calculate the posterior probability of all the you know classes, and you have to find one there. You have to find out the maximum one. So yeah. So, uh, um, uh, coming to uh, the implementation part of this particular algorithm, whatever we have discussed. So, let me quickly finish within two minutes that uh, how 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 you will implement it. And initially, let's say let us uh, let us uh, you know consider that I have only hundred samples, and out of hundred samples, uh, 
class one. I mean, there are fifty samples for class one. There are fifty samples for class two. This data set is very well. I mean, distributed, right? In in, in real life, in real time, you may not find this type of data set because this is well distributed, and because all the classes contain similar type of samples, you may not find this situation in real time. And what I did is the Turing testing. We know that, right? So I have divided seventy percent and thirty percent. I have taken the ratio for training and testing. And uh, uh, this can be done randomly. This will be done randomly, 70%. And uh, there is something called a stratified training and testing division. And if you can, uh, if, if it is possible, please go through that. What is stratified? I mean, there the, the, will be a similar class distributions. So what I will do is, so if I simply take 70% of the 100 samples, so it will randomly pick uh, 70 samples from. You know, 100 samples. So th th there might be some cases where there will be 30 samples from one class and uh, 40 samples from another class. Or maybe, maybe it's 70 percent. But stratified is nothing but 70 percent from both the classes. So uh, there will be less chance that your model will be biased towards one class. So that, if I, that is why as stratified is very very important. And uh, train set. Uh, so what I applied is here. Let's say stratified. So it is well distributed. 70 percent on both the class. So that's why my train set contains 35 and 37 samples and test set contents uh, the remaining 15 and 15 i hope you can easily understand this uh, whatever we have discussed right now and how we have divided the data into two different parts training and testing so now the question is what are the things you will calculate from the training i mean how you will design the bias and recognition model so what you need is exactly two terms right the, what is the what are the terms likelihood as well as the prior probability prior probability is the a priori knowledge and that I'll show you how easy it is to calculate the pair probability. And these are basically calculated from the training set. And to calculate the likelihood, we need two parameters. What are those? Now, mu and capital C. So mu and capital C. So the prior probability can be easily calculated of class one and class two, which is how will you calculate? And uh, you are in the training phase right now. You cannot use the test set. And uh, the, you have to only use the testing the train set. And the prior probability is nothing but 35 by 70 over here. Simple, very simple. So based on that training set, you can also expect uh, that uh, what should be, and it is it is an equiprobable uh, no, prob problem. If you can see both the classes contain similar samples, it is equiprobable. So based on simple probability, you cannot decide that uh, uh, that uh, the new sample will belong to which category because it is equiprobable one. This is where actually this uh, Bayesian will help you. Uh, and the prior probability for both the uh, cases for both the classes is 35 by 70 and 35 by 70 and then what you will calculate is so now you are having a bunch of samples in class one and a bunch of samples in class two they may form a cluster and uh, and you, you know that how to calculate the mean of each samples so and then definitely you can calculate the mean of each samples of class one as well as class two because it is required and these are the parameters you need to evaluate during the training phase of the bias and decision model. So then once you evaluated or computed all these things, what you will do is simply testing for each testing sample, what you will do for each testing sample like X over here, you will calculate this formula likelihood as well as the prior probability we've already calculated from the training set. Simply you will multiply and you'll get the value called as postural probability and you will assign the label to that particular sample based on the maximum postural probability. So right now i will show you and then this type of you know, uh, uh, problem i mean this Bayesian classifier can also be simplified to different types of uh, minimum distance based classifiers like euclidean and mahalanovis and uh, um, that you can go through that uh, how to and what are the conditions which are required to simplify this to Bayesian classifier to the minimum euclidean classifier and uh, yeah so uh, Professor Puja, are you there? I will take only 10 minutes, okay? Yes, sir. I will take 10 minutes because I have to explain it uh, uh, using, you know, one problem that we discussed. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I, will, I will show you the code directly that uh, uh, I have written. Uh, and uh, this is a MATLAB platform. And uh, you, can, you just see, if you like Python also, you can write it. You just see the logic over here. I don't want to force anybody to write that our code in MATLAB or Python, whatever uh, your favorite, uh, so you can write on it. And uh, yeah, uh, so can you just see that uh, how I have uh, written the code for the same problem, whatever I have discussed for this uh, problem. And initially, as I mentioned, that they are extracting the features. So uh, from the images using Wavelet and Entropy concept. 
uh, and uh, entropy texture features and later uh, the the model i mean the features are passed to the may bias classifier to classify it and i will show you uh, how i have written the code and initially the images are in one folder the images are there in one folder maybe in real life you may find the images in different different folders and uh, the different folders represent sometimes different categories and uh, maybe you may find there are some sub folders inside the folders as well and uh, that uh, again depends upon how the data is structured so here the data is whatever is with me has not divided uh, initially in training and testing so i am the person who is dividing and there are some you know samples which are belonging uh, to this category this is supervised classification problem i know which are the images of who are uh, from normal category and who are from i mean that are from uh, basically abnormal category so these are the images which is there and uh, in, in uh, one folder and uh, what i have uh, try to do is i so you can you can see the path over here i want to read all the images one by one so what i did is i first uh, uh, simply read the images it is there in one single folder and if you want you can also read the images from different folder codes are there if you google it you can you find it and uh, so then what i we obtained from is, is uh, this is the number of images how many numbers are there so from this i i i will definitely get to know about that how many images are there and then what i want every time i will uh, read one one image and i will extract the features and store it in a matrix so this is the way i have written the code and if you want you can also change because the writing style the coding style is varies from different person to person and uh, this is how i have written the code because i like it and the way i have written mostly the variables i like the variables i like this type of naming so i have written so you may give your own namings whatever you want so if you can see, uh, so first what I'm doing is simply I'm reading uh, the first image and this J, I've used a for loop to, to, to combine all the feature vectors. And inside this, this, this particular uh, loop is designed to store the feature vectors of all the samples uh, in a matrix, right, and called as feature vector. So J here uh, is nothing but one to all the images uh, presented over that, uh, uh, present inside that folder. And initially I have uh, read that image so I've read that image and what I did is the images are in the form of BMP and it was indexed image. So I, I thought of, you know, changed it to uh, index to gray image. And then, then uh, and I hope uh, this part has already been covered in image processing things. And then uh, once I have that image, first image, what I will do is I will pass to the, I used to generally write the code in terms of functions. I love functions, so modules in writing programs in different different modules. So what I have written is here I have written one function, but uh, this function will return is nothing but a vector, simple seven dimensional vector. So but this function is basically to extract the entropy features from the different subbeds of the wavelet, and for that I have used some functions over there. Signal processing uh, function, just a minute. Why it is not opening? Okay, okay, okay. I have to change the code over that. Oh, okay, I'll show you. Uh, right now the uh, function over here this function basically returns if you can see uh, this function takes uh, input uh, as an image and keeps f as an f is nothing but a vector if you can see over here and these are the cores whatever is there already in MATLAB i have used to to implement i mean to decompose the uh, images using wavelet uh, transform and uh, i have done uh, i have extracted the coefficients at level one and level two based on that paper they have mentioned and uh, whatever if, if you want to play with this you can play you can take any value as a feature and you can take maybe just go through and investigate something that what should be the features initially so then uh, so here as i mentioned that uh, i have to take uh, you know seven features as entropy features or texture features from each of these sub and these sub are stored in some variables I mean, in matrix, uh, this, this is also matrix A1, uh, H1, V1, D1, which all are of 128 cross 128 size, and A2, H2, V2, and D2 are of 64 into 64 size. They have also mentioned the same. You can verify it later on. So then what happened is I have simply extracted the entropy and features from each of the sub -band and stored in a vector, if you can see, stored in a vector. And then I'm so given an image, or if I want to pass an image to this function, so what it will do is simply it will store the uh, entropy values in a vector, and it will pass to this, uh, you know, uh, to this uh, to this matrix. And it, what it says is the J value is initially one, 
and the j below i mean the feature vector this is a matrix the first row will be filled by the feature vector of the first image so similarly the for loop will run for j number of i mean the, uh, the images the, the number of images are let's here it is 160 and it is been run up to 160 times and every time it will generate a feature and finally it will generate a feature vector of size 160 cross 7 because the number of images are 160 only so if you can uh, if you want to see it you can see uh, the size of this you see it is there 160 cross 7 so there are 160 samples and seven number of features so this would be the size of the feature vector and then then i have generated a target vector because the target vector i know that initially it was provided with normal abnormal word because i love to provide the numeric values one and two over here so but that's why i i have uh, you know generated the target vector because i know which image is from what category and then then i what i did is simply i i have stored this feature vector in a new variable not required at all this one if you don't want then you should not use this one this is a, uh, uh, extra thing what I've written. So then the next thing is once you are having uh, this type of you know of a uh, feature matrix. So what you can apply is you can simply uh, divide the data set into two parts, training and testing. And sometimes uh, for some problem, the training images are given in one folder and testing images are given in one folder. So you can separately uh, apply the feature instruction technique in, in that case. And uh, in some cases it is not given. So in this case it is not given. So that's why I have applied a training testing division. Uh, method over here and that which is nothing but a random you know division a random uh, a division of 70 and 30 and if you want to go through this it is very easy that you will uh, at a time you so one one uh, sample you will read and you will pass it to either training or testing along with the labels label is very important whenever you are uh, selecting one sample for training which you have to take the training samples as well with that so then then once uh, once you divide the data set into different different parts i mean a training and testing part so what you will use is you can simply provide the data to the classifier and the classifier which i have designed is nothing but a bias and classifier over here if you see the bias and classifier what it takes is four different types of arguments the first one is training data the second one is training level third one is a testing data and testing level these four are the arguments which are required uh, to this function, which I have written. As I mentioned, that you can also write the same program here also, but uh, it will be difficult to understand for others if you write like this. And that's why it's better always to write um, the, uh, the different things in terms of functions. And let us now discuss whatever we have discussed uh, for Bayesian classification, whether I have followed the similar procedure. There are also the optimized way to write this code, but uh, I have the way I explained it. I mean, the methods I have explained over here, whether I'm following the same steps to write the Bayesian classification uh, 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 code or not. So you can see it one by one. And uh, as I mentioned that first, we have to check that how many I have written a generalized code. So I don't know that how many classes are there. So because I've written a general code, so that means generalized code means what? It can be applied on any data, right? So I don't know that how many classes are there. So, so what you have to do is you have to check there are how many classes are there. So that's why I've written this, so how many unique values are there in that trend level. So it will tell you that yes, three number of classes or two number of classes are there. So then next, uh, what happens over here, you can see. So then again, the next uh, uh, thing is to calculate the prior probability for each of the classes. So if, uh, C number of classes are there, as I mentioned. So I have to run one for loop for that. So for I is equal to one to C, here let's say C is two. So what it will calculate is simply that how many training i mean from the training you see i'm always using training i'm not using testing okay so but this is the training part i'm discussing about so from the training set itself you have to check that how many samples are are having a level one i mean class one and uh, we have to find it and you have to find how many are there divided by the total uh, you know, length of the training output I mean total number of training samples so that I, initially the i value was one so we have calculated the prior probability for the value one so next what you will do is again the value will increase the c value will be two and accordingly you will calculate the prior probability so the next statement i mean the next step is to calculate uh, the mean of each class and covariance of each class so there is a function available for covariance and if you want you can also write your own function and you can use that 
So for again, I run one more for loop. You can also write within one for loop. But just to show you that the way I represented in this particular slide. So I have done like this. So as I told that this is not an optimized code. So you can write an optimized code uh, for this. So just to show you that how uh, the different step, uh, steps can be implemented. So I've done like this. So what uh, I have uh, uh, done here is, if you can see that for every class, every class, uh, what I have to calculate is the mean. So the every uh, the, there'll be uh, so mean. So mean is not a single value, rather mean is a vector. So I've stored the uh, mean vector in a cell, which is a, like a structure over here. And cell can uh, have store a different similar type of vectors or matrices at a time. In MATLAB, it is there. This provision, maybe in Python, there is some other provision. If you can, you can read it. And uh, the covariance matrix of the cell. So what exactly this for loop does is it is calculating the mean as well. See, mean of i. This i is nothing but the class level, right? It will calculate mean one, then S one. S is nothing but the covariance. In some book, it is written in terms of S. In some book, it is written in terms of sigma. So but here, I have chosen S. It should be actually capital C as per my you know, notation in the, in the theoretical part. And if you can see over here, this will finally generate. And at the end of this problem, what you will get is M one, S one, M two, S two. S two is nothing but the covariance matrix. And then, then, the, then. So that means uh, the the churning part is over. Uh, here the model uh, right now is having uh, all the values, all the unknown parameters we calculated. So now for the testing part, what you have to do is we have to run a for loop for each of the testing sample, and you have to calculate the posterior probability for that. You know it is required. What is required is likelihood and posterior probability, and that's what I've written in the code. If you can see, I have, I have uh, run one for loop, and it varies from LL. Uh, is equal to one to size of the text input one. That means the, the how many test samples are there. So for each sample, uh, so I am storing it in X. We will have explained it using X variable. So you can also store in another variable or the other way. You can write the program. So what I want to do here is for this X, what I have to calculate is the conditional probability. That means the big equation you have seen. See the equation. And then again inside this for loop, I am using one more for loop Y because just to represent the class, because you have to calculate the posterior probability for both the classes. So again, I have to run one more for loop for this. And so that's why I have run one more for loop inside this. And the X value is there. For the same X value, you have to calculate the posterior probability for class one, as well as class two. That's why I use a for loop over here. And that varies from one to C. And uh, look, at the, uh, look at the equation, the same equation, e to the power this, this, this. And when it is I, I means when it is one, so you will use M1. And when it is uh, class one, also you have to calculate S1 at that time. And that we have already discussed. And finally, this posterior probability is nothing but the conditional probability, whatever you got over here for the uh, value i and multiply by P of i, which has already been calculated in the training set, from the training set, which is nothing but the prior probability. So, so after the end of this for loop, you will get two different posterior probability. Uh, and and uh, then how will you decide that? Uh, uh, that particular sample X, that means the first testing sample will belong to which category? So that based on the maximum value you will choose. So that which one is the, I mean, what should be the class level? So, but this is for the first, first sample you have right now calculated the actual output predicted by the Bayesian model. So similarly, what you can do, you can run the for loop for number of times. I mean, the number of times means the number of uh, times is equal to the number of testing images. And, and uh, what you will do is finally you will get a vector uh, of size, let's say testing and I mean finally you will get a vector of actual or predicted output and, and it is a supervised problem and we all know that there is something called as desired output which is given to us and you can match with every element and you can check that how many uh, you know, samples are correctly classified and based, on, yeah. and based on that you can calculate the accuracy and a lot of other parameters as well. Yeah. Lot of other parameters you can calculate the confusion matrix you can calculate a lot of other parameters so if i run the program if i go back to the main program and run the program also i have used something called as k nearest neighbor classifier so if i run the program over here you can see uh, this is a very simple data set which i consider very well distinguished um, uh, data set well uh, if you can see uh, there are 43 number of uh, testing samples uh, then out of these 43 samples, the KN and classifier, the KN nearest number classifier could able to classify 40 samples. And uh, oh, interestingly, this time 
uh, what happens uh, in FBIS classifier have correctly classified all the samples for this particular simple data set. So this is how well, you can apply, I mean, uh, given a problem, pattern recognition problem, you can use uh, any, any, any feature extraction technique to extract the features. And then you can apply some feature reduction technique if required. And then you can apply uh, uh, those features when I mean, you can pass those features to any classifier. So this is the framework I, I have shown to you. And, and, and when, you, when you discuss about, I mean, when other people will discuss about deep learning, so you might not prefer this type of methods. But still, as I mentioned, you have to be very, very careful whether to know. The first you have to be very, very important, as I mentioned, that uh, to know about that when to use deep learning and how to use deep learning. That is very, very important. Other speaker will discuss more about it. I will not discuss more about it. And I think we are running out of the time. And uh, uh, yeah, so if I having any questions, so only one question is OK. Otherwise, uh, uh, yeah, uh, OK. Uh, one question I can, uh, yeah, I can read. Uh, yes, what if, uh, what if, uh, uh, what if, we extract more features. You can, you can. This is for example. This is a paper they have, uh, you know, uh, they have uh, used these features just to show you that how to implement a paper, uh, you know, very quickly. So that's why I've seen, I've shown you that is uh, yes, just just go through the paper and uh, let me. Uh, I, I I want to implement it. Then how can I implement it? It's the same paper. So it's always you know uh, uh, suggestible also. It's always suggested that uh, whatever the paper you are reading, please go through the good articles. I mean, the papers which are published in very peer-reviewed journals and the conferences as well. The conferences which are very, very tough conferences in this particular domain called as CVPR, Computer Vision and Petrol Recognition, ICCV, SCCV, ICML, and NEEPS, as well as ICPR, ICIP. These are all top conferences are happening and all around the India and, uh, sorry, not world. So you can, you can go through the articles, the recent articles to choose the recent topic on it. And I also discussed some of the recent topic. Um, and the paper which I have gone through and which we have been working on. And uh, you can consider any number of features, uh, you know, any type of features as well. Why only one statistical feature entropy? Why not energy? Why not standard deviation? Why not correlation? So that's why I told that please go through some of the articles to extract varieties. Why not even geometrical features? And this is the features in terms of coefficients in frequency domain. You can also extract some features, local features as well from pixel domain. And you can combine both. And uh, we can fuse the features, and uh, maybe that feature vector, who knows, will be will provide very good results. So again, that depends upon the expertise or the investigations you made on the literature that uh, what type of features will go, I mean, will work on your model. And uh, uh, so very, very important thing. And at last, I will, I will uh, show you uh, one to slide that uh, these, uh, you know, uh, the tools uh, uh, rightly people are using that uh, for ML programming, you know, uh, Python, R, MATLAB, and for machine learning tools, people are talking about nowadays TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, Weka is there. But all are preferring, and I will also suggest all of you to please start uh, learning Python and TensorFlow and Keras. This is our future. And uh, and deep learning tools, Keras, Pytorch. There are some analytic tools, Spark, Hadoop. Uh, those who are basically focusing on data analytics and uh, deep, big data problems, they basically uh, used to implement on this platform and visualization tools like Jupyter, you all know that. And there's something called a Seaborn. And uh, these are the different tools you can use. And uh, there are some quotes which I like. And if you like, then you can uh, read it out. I should not read. Everybody knows this. So every day you will uh, spend a little bit of time so you can learn the tools. So you can please try to understand the mathematical concept behind it. You will enjoy and you will try to modify it as well. And if you use simply the functions, whatever is there, so you cannot learn. So even suggest your students to write the code and try to, you know, uh, try to put a subject. I mean, uh, suggest you the pattern recognition subject or machine learning course should be there. And then without implementation, without lab, uh, there is no meaning of this particular subject. So I would suggest uh, if, uh, if some institutes are providing this type of course, and they should also provide one, you know practical uh, of this machine learning and pattern recognition along with that so that we can learn even from the students we all know that in the core and uh, we can provide several uh, i mean the tasks to the students and they will come up with the new solutions as well sometimes and uh, we together and can, can solve a variety of problems as well so uh, these are the two very important quotes i usually like and uh, one is provided by the very big scientist we all know that einstein 
and uh, the next one is nothing but uh, Andrew Ng. We know, we all know him, right? He's a, a professor. I mean, he's a professor. He's a very, very famous teacher in the world uh, uh, for machine learning. And recently, I attended his lecture. Uh, he gave a lecture at IIT Bombay. So uh, very, very uh, uh, important statement. I mean, uh, these are if you want to adopt, you can adopt it. And so thank you so much, all of you for listening to me. I think uh, I'm really running out of the time. Even I had taken two different lectures uh, today at NIT Meghalaya and other. And uh, even I have not taken my lunch, madam. So now I go and take my lunch. And, uh, thanks. So, uh, so thank thanks a so lot, much. sir. We, we have learned various new things with this session, like how to recognize pattern and how to use Bayesian classification and uh, apply the real-time images also. Thank you once again, sir. I also thank the participants for attending the session. Now, I would like to request to leave the session, and I would li also like to request connect tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. for the, again, new topics and new sessions. So, again, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thanks, you thank all. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you so much to all the organizers.